Chapter 10, Rowboat to Hell. Edgar quickened his pace up the long dirt drive to the gates of Thunder Rose. As ornate as they were, they also invited in a calm and sweet simplicity that stood out over the ominousness, ominousness of the woods beyond the ranch. Edgar was no fool, though, and he knew that magic was afoot and not the good kind. He reached the edge of the property and stood looking back out over the ranch land. Six hundred acres of Texas beauty and charm were being slowly engulfed by a wicked spirit of a dead black stallion bent on revenge. And this horse had already begun its magical work, slowly weaving its tenacious web of destruction straight at Pamela Cartwright, the one it blamed for its den demise. Oh, but Adwood wasn't acting alone. The gang at large, with a vested interest in Thunder Rose, was also lending a magical hand to bring about the downfall of the Cartwright clan. Edgar could sense it, and yet he felt a deep sense of powerful allies also swooping in to support them. Who would win? Well, if he had his way, only love would and could win. Even against the darkest of the dark, love had always prevailed. He reached into his medicine bag and pulled out several pieces of black tourmaline, and albeit small, could hold off the dark from crossing the inevitable and invisible threshold he had placed around the land. Good things were in small packages, and at that Edgar wondered what had become of it. The wooden box with the brass cross on the top was oddly out of the picture, or so it seemed. But Edgar had a knowing that it would be showing itself soon, somewhere unexpected, so he finished his spells and placed the chunks of tourmaline at the side of each post to the large gate. Well, there's that, he thought, starting the lengthy walk back to the house. His mind suddenly flashed to Pamela, and he hoped she was having a good time. He pulled his cell out of his hip pocket and dialed her number. Voicemail. Well, he would try again in a couple of hours. She must be taking a nap after that long drive, he thought, as he reached the house and headed straight for the kitchen and Marguerite's pitcher of ice-cold homemade lemonade. His nerves were a little shot, so he plopped in a jigger full of rum and a dash of her sweet tea and went outside to the back porch. Something was nagging at him, but he couldn't put his finger on it. He decided to try Pamela again. Voicemail. He started to worry, although he didn't understand why. As he wondered what she was doing, a ghostly apparition of a large black stallion stood silhouetted against the afternoon sky, just out of reach of the light, but looming ever closer at the edge of the woods. All was not as it seemed. Again, Edgar had that same feeling. But as the Arnold Palmer worked its magic, and Atwood stood observing its handiwork, Pamela and Miguel came up for air. Hmm, chapter 11, Breathe. Pam was the first to speak as she grabbed for her clothes. Hot steam clouded the windows, and Miguel bubbled a cigar from his jacket pocket. Let's get some fresh air in here. He spoke languidly, as if he were drunk, but it was not alcohol that invaded his spirit. It was a deep and eternal longing that only seemed satiated by sex. He couldn't help it, but fucking was in his blood, and coming into some hot, young, or even older woman always made him high. Wow, he said, not wanting to sound cliche, but knowing it might be, you're freaking amazing, he said, touching her breast as he hardened again. Where's this hotel again, he asked, almost ready for her again. Pamela sat in silence, staring out the window, her head starting to throb from all the alcohol the feeling of Miguel's tight body and huge cock between her legs made her forget all about reality. Even tough and loving Edgar, her man, yes, she was well aware of the current situation, did not seem to be able to quell her lust and yell longing. She wanted to feel free, and right now this was the most free she had felt in a long time. It's that way, she said, hating herself. Better yet, she said, against all better judgment. Come up to the spa with me instead. You deserve to be pampered, too, she said, touching his arm as a tear fell down her cheek. She was really doing this. What was driving her behavior she didn't know or couldn't yet admit to herself, but the high she was under from having her own way pushed all better judgment away. She wanted more of it, 
and so she gave in to carnal pleasure, and quickly, slipping her clothes on as best she could, without getting out of the car, she punched in the name of General Waters' spa into the garmin, and watched Miguel out of the corner of her eye. He dressed quickly, sucking on the cigar as if he still had her nipple in between his lips, and as the passion filled the air again, they both silently vowed to wait until they got to their room this time. Let's ride, Miguel said, through blowing cigar smoke out the window. Pamela pushed her bag further under the seat, and as she did, her hand touched something. It felt like a wooden box but she couldn't figure out what that was or how it could have gotten there. She didn't want to know right now. She just wanted more of him. So she pushed all thoughts of it aside as the rental car pulled back out onto the main road and towards the spa. Pam placed her hand on Miguel's thigh and cozied up next to him, falling into a light dream. He stroked her hand with his and dreamt of the hopefully large sum of money she might give him for their encounter. Heck, he could definitely make this a regular thing with her, he thought. He had never considered being a gigolo before, but his friends many times had joked that he was pretty enough to wet some woman's whistle and also make a living out of it. And this beauty sure seemed to be a catch. He let out a deep breath, dreaming of all the possibilities as the car drew closer to the destination. And while the couple dreamt of more carnal pleasure... The wooden box with the brass cross on top began to glow. Chapter 12 Innocent Reflection Moxie spent the rest of the afternoon sitting around the fire pit at the old campsite. The tents had remained and she was sitting languidly sipping a lemonade that Mar Marguerite had freshly made from the Meyer lemons left over from the last harvest off the lemon tree in her garden. Marguerite had planned an elaborate feast for the group and was hoping there would be plenty for everyone. That Edgar and Diego could eat enough for four men was not lost on her, so she had purchased a large pig from the local butcher and was planning a Hawaiian-themed dinner. She thought to wait for Pam to return, but she also knew this ragtag little group could use some cheering up and high spirits. Marguerite knew her people, sometimes better than they knew themselves. Edgar rode in from the pasture and handed his glass down to Luke, who took the reins of Edgar's paint pony so he could get down without being thrown. Somehow this little paint had been so spooked up on the higher range. As Edgar had tried to phone Pam again, the little horse looked like it had seen a ghost. Penelope had reared up in a startled fit and come down hard, almost on Edgar's foot. What in the world, he said out loud. Girl, what has gotten into you? He pulled hard on her reins and stood right in front of her, hoping to block her view of whatever it was that was causing such a fuss. Well, what he didn't see was the shadow of the larger and more beguiling Atwood staring them both down. He was able to calm the little pony and decided it was time to head back to the ranch house. Maybe the weather was going to change, he thought to himself. These ponies were so sensitive that almost anything could spook them and send one into a dangerous frenzy. As Edgar saddled up, the stallion was approached by something that could only be seen with the inner eye. A large and very strong spirit of the darkness reached up with a curled and gnarled hand and patted the ghostly stallion on the neck. The smoke of a dark night fire filled the air, and chilling laughter filled the great wood. Thunder Rose will soon be mine, the ghostly apparition said to no one in particular, as it too saddled up on the back of the black stallion and rode into the darkness of the underbrush and taller pines. Edgar was still unsure what have, could have caused such a fuss, but he decided to go back and find out. This ranch was fresh out of the energy of the screech, and it was just as easy for something else to take its place. He gave over Penelope to Luke and headed to the barn. He would take the 4x4 four four Polaris instead. He pulled his medicine bag down from the horse's saddle and put everything, including his shotgun, into the Polaris. Maybe he should take Moxie, he thought for a split second. But if he was wrong, he didn't want to waste her time. She was still recovering from her event with the screech, and he could tell that her energy needed replenishing after such an encounter. 
The Polaris stuttered to a start, and Edgar revved the small engine to move the older fuel through the lines. "'Tell Marguerite I'll be back in time for her luau,' he told Luke. And as Luke waved an acknowledgment over the sputtering of the motor, Edgar sped away toward the pasture and the great woods tree line. It was dank and musty smelling as the Polaris kicked up old dead leaves and pine needles. Edgar could sense that something felt different about the trees in this location. It was almost as if they were trying to warn him about something as their long limbs waved in the wind that was now starting to pick up. Winds of change, Edgar thought, making note of his entry point into the woods in case he needed to get out in a hurry. He didn't care if the screech was gone. He was starting to agree with Marguerite. There was something else more sinister going on here. He pulled the Polaris to a stop under a large bank of larger oak trees, and the hair on the back of his neck stood up. It felt electric and very dark under this tree canopy. He pulled his jacket from his pack and shrugged into it, aware that the temperature in the woods seemed to have dropped. Must be a storm blowing in, he thought, as he buttoned up the denim jacket and shouldered the rifle in his medicine bag. He pulled the big flashlight from under the seat and looked towards the opening in the trees that would take him further into the woods. This was the same location where all the terrible screech had made their encampment in the cave under the larger oaks. He had never fully explored that location after Moxie's triumph over them. The screech were really still somewhat of a mystery to Edgar. He still wasn't completely sure where they had come from or how they had managed to make such a stand against the light here in this amazing and ancient forest. These groves had to be at least 300 years old, Edgar thought, touching the bark of the older trees. He silently wished them a reverent bow as he looked around trying to find the cave entrance he had seen the last time he was out here. As Edgar looked around, he felt he was being guided to keep moving deeper into the great woods. He felt somehow that he was being guided by something beyond his own inner compass, so he let go and allowed himself to be led. It was in these moments that Edgar marveled at spirit and the way that if you simply allowed and stopped trying to interfere, that the most magical of things could manifest. So as he stayed out of his head and aloud, he found himself right in front of a great cave entrance. There was still the ancient symbols on the front to the left and right that those darn screech had painted there in the blood of the goat they had slaughtered on the land. He shivered slightly at the thought of it. But the screech were gone now, and he was anxious and more so curious to see what lay inside that cave. Why he was being drawn here, he wasn't completely sure. But he did know that this was part of why he had come back to the ranch each and every winter since he could recall. He was inexorably drawn to this land, and it was a pulling at his heart that he couldn't quite understand. As he stepped closer to the cave, he felt himself being almost pulled inside by an energetic force he couldn't understand. But it didn't feel bad, only that it just wanted him to keep going. So he stepped inside with one, and then both feet into the dark entrance. He pulled his flashlight from his bag and allowed the bright light to fill the spaces around him. He saw something on the walls of the cave, but his spirit guide stepped in and told him to keep going, keep walking into the larger center part of the cave. So he ignored the blood-stained walls and the remnants of the screech, as blood-curdling as he had recalled them to be, now he only felt compassion and a lingering sense of regret for not being able to conquer them himself. It had taken Moxie and her open and kind heart to send them away. And now he pondered why his own heart had not been able to answer that call. But that was for another time. As his feet almost floated towards the innermost chamber of the cave, his flashlight and the light of his aura and spirit guide's energy leading the way. When he had gone in about 200 yards or so, he began to get a little nervous. He hadn't told anyone he was going cave exploring in his cell. Definitely didn't work this far in. If anything happened, he could easily be trapped inside. He decided to keep trusting the inner nudge that was moving him further inside the damp walls. And then he saw it. Something up ahead almost seemed to be beckoning him in and towards it. Large stalagmites rose out of the walls of the cave, and he could almost make out something that looked like a large stone table at the back of the inner chamber of the cave. 
He stepped forward a few more feet, and then he was inside a massive central chamber in what he assumed was the heart of the cave. And as his eyes focused in on what was around him, he saw something move out of the corner of his eye. He saw whatever it was float and flutter around the inside of the large cave chamber. And as his eyes followed it, the floaty, fluttery thing came down on top of the supposed stone table. And from there a bright light began to emanate. The light flickered and sputtered as Edgar was allowed to move closer, because it didn't feel like his feet were moving of their own accord. It felt like he was almost being carried there. His eyes saw the floaty light like it was beckoning him to move in and see what it had to show him. And as he reached the stone table, he saw with a tingle in his spine what was trying to be shown to him. But what he couldn't figure out was why he needed to see this thing. He smiled to himself at the sight of it, and for no other reason than when he was relieved to find that he was in no real danger at all. Quite the opposite, rather. Edgar looked down at the object on the stone table and laughed with almost giddy delight, for ensconced in the magical floaty light lay the wooden box with the brass cross on the lid, and from inside the box came an emerald and gold light, and from the light came a voice, and from the voice came the words, Edgar, do you trust me? And before he could answer, he was thrown back by the sheer force of the power from within the box. And as he fell to the ground, he heard light laughter come from the box. (laughs) I am here to help you, my son, the voice said with a calm dignity. I am here to save you this time, the voice said, as the light it emanated was almost too much for a mortal being to withhold. As Edgar lay on the ground, unable to stand due to the magnificence of the energy from within the box, he had a vision Whether this was being shown to him by his guides or the being within the box, he wasn't sure. But he was sure of one thing. He had to get to Pamela and get to her fast. As Edgar looked around, he felt he was being guided to keep moving deeper into the great woods. He felt somehow that he was being guided by something beyond his own inner compass. So he allowed himself to be led. Uh Uh-oh. He had to get to Pamela. What he had to do is he had to get to Pamela, and he had to get to Pamela fast. All right, friends. So we're going to stop here, and there's actually no healing right now. We're going to have a big, um, we're going to have an interesting um, session after the next couple of chapters. I won't tell you exactly what it is right now, but all of this is kind of leading up to that particular part. So I'm going to leave this here for now. And the next time we see you, we're going to be going deeper and do some inner mystery school teachings with you all. So until then, I bid you a fond farewell.